Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really awesome guest today involved uh, in creating a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Brad Ringeisen, who is the uh, Executive Director of the Innovative Genomics Institute. Uh, that is an organization founded uh, by 2020 uh, Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna for her work uh, in CRISPR technology and gene editing, located at the University of California Berkeley campus. And their mission is to bridge uh, this revolutionary gene editing tool set uh, to affordable and accessible solutions, both in the area of human health, agriculture, climate change, uh, Dr. Ringeisen is a physical chemist. He has his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, did his bachelor's work in chemistry at Wake Forest, uh, and he's a pioneer himself in the area of uh, live cell printing, uh, an experienced administrator of both scientific research and product development. Uh, before joining uh, IGI, uh, Dr. Ringeisen was the director of the Biologic Technology Office over at DARPA. Uh, there he managed uh, a division working on a really broad set of uh, areas and including biology, physical sciences, engineering, and programs in his office, included everything on research and gene editing, epigenetics, neurotechnologies, uh, food security and biomanufacturing, just to name a few, in addition to diagnostics and therapeutic development. Uh, and prior to DARPA, uh, he ran his own research group at the United States Naval Research Laboratory uh, as head of their bioenergy and biofabrication section. And there he additionally oversaw a really diverse range of programs, including things like uh, laser-assisted printing approaches to biology, organs on a chip, microbial energy harvesting, really uh, a, a really interesting portfolio. Uh, and now he uses this amazing expertise to help me guide IGI scientific and development strategy. Uh, his duties also include uh, entrepreneurship, working with biotech investors and companies to ensure the commercial translation of those technologies, donor outreach development, and a wide range of other responsibilities. Uh, we're honored to have him with us today. A lot of really interesting themes to get into. Uh, but Dr. Brad, Bring Geisen, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited to, to talk about this amazing technology that we're trying to develop at the IGI. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, you've been on an amazing journey, Brad. I, I, you know, I'd love to start off and, and talk about you for a little bit because you, you've been doing some really amazing things. Take us back though to to the the early early days because I yeah, you know I, yeah. I took the opportunity to pull down your PhD um, uh, <laughs> as, as collisions and reactions of hydrochloric and hydrobromic acid in liquid glycerol uh, maybe not yeah. as sexy who, a, a topic who wouldn't want to who wouldn't want to study that Ira I mean come yeah, on it's, 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 uh... talk about those days a bit uh, so, how did this all get know, started yeah so you know I worked my mentor in graduate school was an amazing scientist an amazing individual named Gil Gilbert Nathanson. And Gil, to his credit, I know that the title of my topic was not the most exciting topic in the world, but Gil was an innovator in his own right. And, you know, he's a physical chemist. Really, we studied, we studied surface chemistry. Yep. And honestly, if I take anything away from my PhD, it's the breadth of what Gil taught me in terms of the breadth of cross, cross, you know, cross-disciplinary science, yep. because interfacial and surface chemistry that's just code word for any of a number of different, every reaction essentially occurs at the interface and at a surface. So when you're thinking about an mRNA vaccine and you're making lipid nanoparticles, that's surface chemistry. When you're talking about a reaction at a cell, 
that's surface chemistry. When, a, when something binds, when a CAR yep. T cell uh, is looking to bind, it's recognizing those surface elements. So I really consider myself, instead of a you know, quote unquote physical chemist, I really consider myself an interfacial or surface chemist. And I think Gil really taught me about, about that. And so he, he looked at the interfaces of liquid, liquid reactions. And crazy enough, like what excited me about his work, he put liquids in giant vacuum chambers. Mm -hmm. Who puts liquids in vacuums? You know what happens yeah. when you put a liquid in a vacuum yep. chamber? It bubbles all over the place and it goes crazy. Liquids don't go together with vacuums. And so that was Gill's big innovation was figuring out ways to actually study liquids and how the interactions and reactions occur at that liquid interface. And that was really Gill's brilliance. And number two, last thing I'll say about, about Gill and University of Wisconsin, Gill, his philosophy in science was you don't know when innovation and inspiration is going to strike you. So being in Gill's group meant that you had to be ready to answer a question and to be able to come up with a solution at any time. He would he was famous for saying, I come up with my best ideas in the shower. And you know, I can't write stuff down in the shower. So I've got to do everything I can in my head. So we would have to do back of the envelope calculations. We had to memorize eight pages of figures and numbers and things that would allow us to think on our feet in our head and make these calculations. And I'm telling you, I still use those skills today to be able to quickly just be able to react on your feet, to be able to make calculations, to be able to give people to hit those pressure points of, on scientists that maybe they're not used to being hit with because I feel like I can quickly respond and quickly be able to do things. So I really feel, I, I feel indebted to a great, great, great amount to both the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Madison and, and to Gil Nathanson. Awesome. And, and you know, I guess staying on that theme for a moment of surface chemistry or the sort of the mm -hmm. interfaces, uh, you, you head over to uh, set up your lab at the, the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. And here, again, you know, a fascinating array of projects, this theme, bubbles up <laughs> again yeah, yeah, you're, you're yeah. working on uh laser printing of cells uh in in hydrogel scaffolds you're also i had to do some research i i, I do nothing about gamma proteobacteria uh, mm -hmm. uh shawanella oneidisis but um uh, working on the microbial fuel cells, but at the same time, you know, they make all these interesting biofilms as they're hanging awesome. out. It's, all, it's all, all on the surface of, of the, all the surface again. Biofilms and, yeah. Talk about this because this is another thing we'll be getting into in terms of um, sort of uh, the ability to explore, the ability to play in a lab and not, you know, not worry about a product uh, next year, but to think about these big sky sort of moonshot ideas. Talk a little bit about your time at U.S. Naval yeah. Research Lab. Well, as I think back in my whole career, Ira, honestly, I do have this theme of sort of thinking big and, and breaking, breaking new ground and trying to come at problems from sort of a different perspective. Uh, you know, and when I, when I joined DARPA, we always used to talk about orthogonal process. Yep. Like don't just swim with all the other ideas and all the other fish, like try to come at problems from orthogonal, uh, orthogonal ways of thinking about problems. And the, my work at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory was exactly that. So first of all, I came from an academic family. My Both my parents worked at Clemson University. My dad ended up going all the way up through academic administration and ultimately became a president chancellor at, at, at a university. So I, when I went to graduate school, I assumed I was going to go into a university and go down an academic path. But this opportunity at the Naval Research Lab came up for me to do a postdoc at the Naval Research Lab. And ultimately, it turned into a research position. And I was able to give the freedom to, to start my own group there. Um, so that, that turning point was a big turning point. Instead of focusing on teaching and education and having those components be part of my professional life, I really went to a place where discovery, innovation, patents, um, and, and the mission, and the mission of working towards a better you know, set of capabilities for the, for the Navy, that was what got us out of bed every day. Every day we got up, okay, what could we do? For, for bioprinting and cell printing, it was tissue engineering. It was these organs on a chip to start to understand you know, changes in, in physiological conditions and to be able to model that on a chip rather than having to do animal studies or, or human studies. Yep. And for the energy work, it was all about just needing energy when and where you need it. And for the Navy, guess what? That meant on the ocean. And there were people working on the floor of the ocean, but my work really focused on the, on the water column. And, and these, these floaters and these sensors that would float through the water column. 
And we got a lot of attention and a lot of funding to look at ways to be able to generate power sort of autonomously in those in those water column kind of environments. And so again, you know, in every case, I came into my lab and they wanted uh, they were doing microelectronic circuits. They were using laser printing, essentially, the, these, these new laser technologies to work on microelectronics. I thought I was probably joining a group to learn about material science and, and these <laughs> microelectronic systems. D Doug Chrissy, the, the guy that I did my mentor, you know, my, my postdoc with, was like, the very first day was, Brad, you're going to be my biologist. You're going to go do biology, which it was the, the biggest blessing that I had in my entire life. This was back in the year 2000. It was the beginning of this century of biotechnology. And here I was coming in as an interfacial surface chemist. And I was forced to learn about biology. I was forced to learn to, how to culture bacteria, how to culture mammalian cells. Then we just started throwing every facet of biology in front of a laser. What, <laughs> what better, you know, it's this 25, 20, 26 year old young scientist fresh out of a PhD. And I just get to throw stuff in front of a laser. It was the most fun position I possibly could have ever imagined in my life. And it's so funny. Everything seemed to work. It was a magical environment where we threw proteins in front of the laser. We made active protein films and thin films and patterns of proteins for biosensing and bioelectronics. Then we moved on to bacteria and we, we started printing bacteria. Guess what? The bacteria were viable. They were alive. I remember this aha moment where I was literally taking a, a culture of E. coli onto this support. It was a support that had to hold the, the biological material that you were trying mm -hmm. to print. We didn't have a we didn't have a cartridge per se that or or a reservoir. We had to put it on a disc, and that disc would then be the the support that the laser was able to transfer the material off. Well, we didn't know, uh, but but we needed to to solidify the bacteria to be able to print because everything that they printed in the lab prior to this was a solid. Nobody had printed liquids, mm -hmm. so we felt okay. How are we going to turn these liquid cultures of E. coli into a solid? We froze them. You froze them, but you lose about 40, 50% of the bacteria, but we froze them. So I remember taking this frozen culture of, of E. coli and literally holding it with tweezers in front of the laser and watching ice crystals, ice crystals transfer over onto the, the, the surface we were printing to. And at that point, I knew we had something special because mm -hmm. This laser, everybody thought it's all this energy, everything's going to melt, the cells are going to be destroyed. It, it's just going to destroy, it's going to obliterate all of the cells. But as soon as I saw ice crystals, I knew that the heat transfer was minimal and that there was a good chance that those bacteria were going to survive. And they were. We saw cultures growing up. Just a few hours later, we started to see cultures growing up. And we know that we had done one of the first live cell bioprinting experiments in the world. And that was really the aha moment. We moved on to mammalian cells. We cultured mm -hmm. mammalian cells. We stopped freezing things. We started just using hydrogels and we started transferring live human cells. Yeah. And then we started, okay, this is something big now. We're talking about 3D printing. We're talking about really trying to reconstruct tissue. And ultimately those are the directions that we did. But this was back in the early 2000s, Ira, early 2000s. And it's taken 20 plus years for these bioprinters to actually start to see a role. I serve on an advisory committee for the, for NASA now. There's bioprinters on the International Sp Space Station. Yep. And it all started back in 1999 and the early 2000s, back where people were starting to show that you could actually use a lot of different tools to print, uh, to print biology. So there's a lot of exciting work that I did. And I was just really thankful that I was given this research position where we could just discover new science and really mm -hmm. take risks and a lot of times those risks paid off um, for both energy and autonomous sort of production of, of energy and bioenergy, but also for this field, this now very robust field of bioprinting. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, speaking about risk taking and, and, and you know, uh, at this point, you know, you're you have this amazing portfolio. You move on to DARPA BTO. You're doing all sorts of things there again. At the you know, there's one paper I saw on the sort of gene expression in the blood brain barrier, and we'll be getting into that in a bit when we talk about uh, how we get CRISPR certain places and so forth. But um, I wanted to just segue briefly because I, I'd love to get your thoughts. We've we've had um, on the show, you know, a lot of uh, DARPA uh, folks coming through as well as their 
brothers and sisters of you know at IARPA, ARPA H, ARPA E, oh, and so forth. It's a growing, um, growing community now. <laughs> it, it's an awesome community. It's an awesome model, and we begin also to uh, see uh, the the DARPAization of 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 other things as well. I mean, people from the Welcome Trust, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhao from DARPA of DSO, who went over mm -hmm. to Raytheon, she got a little lab there. Again, it's sort of this risk-taking thing that there's no products coming through this anytime soon, but we've got to play. Talk a little bit about just your your thoughts on sort of what you see. and Because in some ways, I look at it, uh, IGI, and we'll get into it in, in, in a little bit, uh, as, as sort of that. Obviously, CRISPR has some short-term stuff that you're doing, but yeah, you know, there's things you got to plan maybe 10, 15, 20 years down the line yeah, when we're yeah. getting some more complex. Talk a little bit about sort of the uh, the DARPAization of, of the of the bio world that we see happening. I think it's kind of exciting. Yeah, there, I think there's two main ways to go about scientific discovery. I think there's certain sets of people that start projects that they have sort of the end application in mind, and they're really trying out different ways to try to achieve that final end application. That's one way of, of trying to go about it. And there are certain offices at DARPA that do work in that way. There, there's a lot of, uh, of the tech, tech offices, the, 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 um, the, you know, the tactical uh, technology office, TTO, the strategic technology office, STO. Um, these are places that say, look, we really have this unmet need in this application space. Please provide different technological paths to try to get there. But they really focus on the end application as the driver of sort of a, a pull, of an application pull. The other philosophy in science, I think, is just the blue sky sort of sandbox of discovery. And, and that sandbox of discovery, oftentimes that sandbox of discovery approach is hindered. It's hindered by kind of trying to constrain your discoveries to a specific application space. And I think my work at the Naval Research Lab falls into that category. The, the, the box that I was brought into for the printing technology that we were trying to develop was a microelectronic printing. They actually were part of a DARPA program. I was paid by DARPA in my yeah. initial and in my in, initial uh, uh, entryway into the Naval Research Lab. But that program, the goal of this program back in 2000 was to actually make a watch GPS. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a noble goal, right? It's a great goal, in fact. But the problem is, is that they didn't shoot far enough down. And after mm -hmm. about two or three years of of this program existing, private industry started making watches with GPS in them. And so, so, so my pivot to biology actually kind of saved that program to a certain extent um, because it gave another outlet for this emerging technological tool. Its original thought pattern was microelectronics. We think this is going to be it. But in reality, is that system really being used that much for microelectronics and, and, and inorganic materials? No, it's actually being used probably more than anything for biology right now, more than anything else. And there's a, there's a company in France now that's trying to, that's commercializing this, this technology and they're actually selling it to laboratories, not to print electronics, but to actually print biology and print biological structures. So that sandbox approach. So oftentimes DARPA does follow that a little bit where they, right. you know, there's some program, the, the defense science office, my office, the biological technologies office. Oftentimes we would give the latitude to the scientists to sort of take emerging technologies and we would, we'd give them, we'd give them fence posts. We'd mm -hmm. give them fence posts to sort of stay, stay between these bounds. But, you know, in some programs we said, look, we just are, are giving you some guidelines, but we really want you to have the freedom to be able to really determine what the best application of those of those technologies might be. Um, living engineered materials was a perfect example of that, you know, where you're literally trying to build materials with living fungal and bacterial uh, uh, species. Mm -hmm. And did we know which application space might be the best? Was it going to be cement? Was it going to be uh, uh, packing materials? We weren't really sure what, what materials might have been it. So we seeded out lots of different projects with lots of different types of technologies. And then actually that program ended with a demonstration out at an airfield in the middle of a desert where people were spraying living bacteria mm. on the ground, just on ground that had been raked and prepared and those bacteria were actually able to harden up and make an airfield that allowed a helicopter to land on that airfield. And so turns out that ended up being the best application for the Department of Defense. There are mm -hmm. other people now that are using this for landscaping and there's living yeah. concrete companies that are starting to, to form yep. to, to start thinking about these things. So if you're too constrained at the early part 
of discovery, oftentimes you can shut down the end application that may actually be the most impactful to the world. And so, but there's those two, those two flights for one sort of bottom up and one sort of top down. But mm -hmm. I think e both of them are kind of equally important. And we had several programs at DARPA that were that tech push as well. Um, one example of one that we started was a atmospheric water harvesting program mm. where we were actually taking, and that was really the water is one of the key logistical hurdles to, uh, to, 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 to the DOD. They, sure. it, it, it's a logistical nightmare to get, uh, 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 you know, a transit transit of water in these big air, you know, very dry areas. They're targets for the enemy to be able to to be able to target those convoys. Um, so we wanted to do it on site, in in very arid environments, and so we put these very tactical um, constraints on the, the 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 community, the scientific community, to be able to push new technologies, and then you would fund several technologies, but the end goal was all the same. So so we saw it on both sides, and I'm I'm not saying one is better than the other, but um, I think I think both ha hold a lot of merit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now let's head over to uh, to Innovative Genomics Institute because you know as I mentioned, um, Dr. Doudna wins the the Nobel in 2020. The year, the organization the year I joined set, the IGI, it was very fortuitous. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was about three, three or four months after I joined. So awesome, <laughs> awesome. And you know, CRISPR, you know, it, it's become part of the lexicon. Um, you, I, I mean, talk a little bit about because you know the organization was set up a few years prior to yeah. the Nobel, but um, talk about how you got there. You know, because you've been hanging out over here on the East Coast with me for <laughs> for, yeah, for, yeah. for the last whole, couple whole decades. Career. Now you're out on the West Coast. You get a phone call. Uh, Brad, we need you to 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 to, to, to help out here and, and organize mm -hmm. this place. Uh, talk a little bit about how uh, you got there. A little bit about your role as executive director, and, and we'll get into uh, projects in a little bit. Yeah. Well. Well. First of all, getting that call from Jennifer Dowden or having those interview sessions with Jennifer Dowden. Uh, what an amazing experience that was, right? Like here yeah. I am at DARPA. I'm running this three hundred million dollar office. Um, and you know things are good, right? I mean, yeah. COVID had just hit. We got plussed up by eighty million dollars to try to, to deliver some short-term wins for COVID. Like things were good. My badge didn't expire probably. For, I think for about two and a half more years at DARPA. Um, but then you see this position open up at at UC Berkeley, um, and for a number of reasons. I mean, I, I think that uh, you know my all I have three children, and and all three of those children were going to be growing uh, and out into college in a couple years, and you know. DARPA is a temporary place as well, Ira. I mean, right. that's one of the the urgencies that's placed on those that go to DARPA. You're you're given this great honor of being there, but at the same time, it's a, it's a term limit. You know that there's going to be a term limit. So, I, even though I still had a couple more years left, you have to know. You have to start. You have to predict what is the jump point, right? Because mm -hmm. you know that it's not a permanent career for the rest of your life. So you have to think as you're going. The downside of that urgency at DARPA is that. The staff are kind of have one eye out into the community a little bit, and you have to think about that landing spot and that jump space. And so for me, when I'm looking at the IGI, I'm looking at Berkeley, what an amazing place to live mm -hmm. out here in Berkeley, and to sort of start that second phase of my career and the second phase of my life with my wife, um, it was really attractive. And then you meet Jennifer through Zoom, by the way. I interviewed entirely on Zoom. This was during this was in May, you know, April and May of 2020. I did I I I I didn't start on site. I hadn't actually met Jennifer for almost a year and a half after mm. we we actually you know face to face met for a year and a half after I started. Um, but the impact that she made personally on me um, during those interviews. You asked about the founding of the institute. She founded this institute with two really, really firm principles. The first was translation. If you want to go work in that sandbox in your lab and do your thing, fine. Maybe we'll give you a little bit of money, but that's not really what the IGI is about. The mm -hmm. IGI is about teams of people coming together, trying to push um, that interdisciplinary, breaking down the silos that exist on Berkeley and UCSF and UC Davis and getting people to work together to try to make an impact in the real world, period. That's goal number one. But we're really unique at the IGI for the second goal that Jennifer founded this institute for. And that is to impact, use this technology, use the genome engineering and genome editing technology to impact those that need the technology the most. We're talking about 
lowering drug prices. We're talking about helping the low middle income farmer, okay? Get higher yields, help push back against climate change and, mm-hmm. and you know flooding and storms and droughts and high temperatures. Like we don't wanna help, you know, look, companies and, 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 and the big ag companies and big pharma companies are gonna do their thing, but we're a nonprofit. And Jennifer founded the IGI um, within the confines of UC Berkeley, a global nonprofit. And we did that because we want to take this technology to impact those that need it. And Jennifer's often quoted as saying that if you have a two or $3 million cure, which look a lot of CRISPR based cures like sickle mm-hmm. cell right now are being priced most likely in the one and a half to $3 million range. And Jennifer says that if it's going to cost $2 million, it's not really a cure. Okay. So that is the philosophy. And we push that for climate. We push it for agriculture and we push it for health. Mm-hmm. So that. That that story, as a 20, 20 year government servant, I considered myself a civil servant. That resonated with me tremendously, and you know, again, my my parents worked for state universities. I saw this, and now I'm I'm a, I'm an employee of the state of California, essentially through the 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 regents of California, University of California, and we don't take this mission lightly at the IGI, and it still gives me it's sort of those goosebump moments. Of, of trying to know what we're trying to accomplish, that it's something greater than just CRISPR. It's something greater than just spinning out a company and trying to make billions of dollars and turn it into a unicorn. It's more than that at the IGI. We do all those things. We do those things. But it's our core mission is still to work with nonprofits. We have the only nonprofit funded CRISPR clinical trial for sickle cell in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the only one. It's funded by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. It's Mm -hmm. been funded by by state and federal sources and philanthropic sources. We're the only one. Everybody else is private capital and and with with startup companies or other other uh, other for profit entities. So that's just a a little a little a little nugget of of what drew what drew me to the IGI. But now if I pivot quickly to sort of what the Institute was like when I arrived versus where we are now. It yeah. really is a different institute. I think Jennifer founded this institute, but like any new organization, any startup, it kind of there's some fits and starts to how the organization gets going. Sure. And it really was sort of a, for me, and coming from the government funding side of things, it was sort of like an NSF philosophy where yeah. you get 150K grant, okay, or you get a 300K grant over three years. It's enough to pay a postdoc. You sort of incremental, incrementally advances the next steps of your lab. That's kind of what the IGI was doing. 100K here, 200K there, 300K there. We had this huge network of 50, 60, 70 different PIs that have sort of received a little bit of money. Then we started some internal work on plant transformations and doing gene editing in plants, but it was really a, 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 a sporadic organization. There wasn't really a lot of cohesiveness to the organization. So when I came in, I immediately identified this as, you know, look, this isn't gonna get to reach Jennifer's vision. This the way that we're doing it right now. If you're just going to give a professor at UC Davis 100K, a professor at UC San Francisco 100K, that's not the vision that Jennifer, this is Jennifer right. Doudna, now Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudna. So I brought the DARPA philosophy into the IGI. And what that means is we would put tens of millions of dollars behind teams, teams of scientists. And those were marrying different technologies, different personalities, different viewpoints together to try to solve big societal problems. And that's what we've been successful now at the IGI. We've raised $11 million through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to go Mm -hmm. after agricultural soils and and crops as ways to be able to harvest carbon dioxide and and, and use the, the, the crops and agricultural soil for carbon dioxide removal. That's a team with Lawrence Livermore National Lab with UC Berkeley, with UC Davis, big, big team. I think there's seven or eight different professors and PIs that are involved in that effort. We just landed a $70 million uh, uh, a grant award through 14 different philanthropists through the TED Audacious project. Mm. That's a, a moonshot project yep. where we're going to try to go in and precisely modify specific organisms and specific mechanisms in the human microbiome and the cow microbiome for the cow to shut down methane methane production in the cow 
and for humans to look at diseases of inflammation and whether mm -hmm. we can shut off some of those some of those pathways of inflammation. That is a moonshot yep. uh, idea. If you could go in instead of using probiotics that sometimes don't work or fecal transplants that require you know heavy antibiotic usage before, throw all that out the window. We're going to go directly in with CRISPR, do oral administration, and just go in and precisely target the organism that you need to make a modification in, but to perhaps even multiple organisms to, to help right. tune a new microbiome that has the function that you want, that prevents a disease or prevents or shuts down methane production. So these are the types of things that the IGI is about, these big projects, big teams with big visions, but it all starts with the technology. Right. And, and what Jennifer and others like Jill Banfield come together with, but it's also um, myself and others inside the Institute focusing on big societal, unsolved societal problems. And that's really the key to success, I think, for the IGI. No, that's outstanding. Really, really outstanding. Um, let's, um, if you don't mind, let's, let's drill down on a couple of these, just cause I, sure. I really want Absolutely. the, the folks to understand, I, I mean, you, you laid, you laid out the, the groundwork there, but, um, I thought it'd be interesting to go into a few of these and one, you know, obviously it, it's widely accepted a CRISPR, uh, well, as we, as you were just mentioning this greater than CRISPR theme, um, Clearly, CRISPR, whether we're talking about genetic disorders or, mm -hmm. or ex vivo modification of, of, of cells or gene therapies and so forth, clearly broad potential there. Uh, and one that, of the yep. things, yeah, one of the things you point out on the on the website is uh, is that at the end of the day, we're just saying that we got to get the CRISPR or the CRISPR plus stuff uh, where it needs to be. Uh, you have something known as the IGI delivery collective, focusing mm -hmm. on things like uh, how we get. Uh, gene editing into uh, airway epithelium. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a project on uh, hematopoietic cell reprogramming, which is such a you know, cellular reprogram is such a hot topic because of you know the the ability to precisely modify genes and you know make that CAR T cell more active against tumors yep. or reprogram yep. for stem cells, whatever it may be. Talk about this IGI delivery collector. I think this is an important piece that might be overlooked by you know, by thinking that we're you know oh, all we do is CRISPR and we walk away no oh yeah CRISPR, gotta... CRISPR is of no value if you can't get right. it where you need it to go at a high right. high rate of efficiency yeah um and right now you hit you hit the nail on the head um the lowest hanging fruit out there right now are these ex vivo approaches and right. look I have no issues with ex vivo approaches I mean they're changing the world I mean they're changing the world of medicine right now. I mean, who 10 years ago, who would have thought that we would have had a cure for sickle cell disease? Right. I mean, that's it's mind blowing. It, it, it's remarkable that, you know, 11 years ago, the, the this this CRISPR, you know, sort of uh, uh, engine, you know, CRISPR being used as as a, a as a genome editing tool. That's 11 years ago. And now, you know, literally nine or 10 years later, you, you it's literally being used. To, to cure sickle cell. So I have no issues with ex vivo approaches. I think they're literally changing the world uh, of, 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 of how we, how we treat diseases, but ultimately our delivery collective is focused on in vivo systemic delivery and in vivo. And this is one of those grand challenges, Ira. This mm -hmm. is if, again, if we're going to go after a topic at the IGI, look, there's countless startup companies going after ex vivo approaches for this indication, that indication, right. that indication. We're not beholden to that. We have philanthropic dollars. Our runway is a little bit longer. We can go after some of those big, you know, more grand problems. And I think, again, one of the things that I learned at DARPA was trying to, to, to ideate an ideal solution, right? We're, I mean, there's a lot of smart scientists out there. And a lot of them are focusing on the next step of their experiment and the next step of their experiment. But just call a time out there for a second and think about independent of the technology, what is the ideal solution to solve the application and the problem that you're going after? And if you take something like sickle cell or if you take something like you know, a, 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 you know cancer or you, know, you, you name whatever the application space is, what would be the ideal solution? Would it be to take cells to do a bone marrow, um, uh, you know, a harvest of HSCs out of the bone marrow, take them out, do a, a horribly uh, ablative approach to be able to get rid of the, you know, to, to, to essentially kill off the remainder of cells that are, that are there, then go through, do a, a, an editing procedure, harvest out the cells that got edited, take time, weeks to grow up those cells, and now, meanwhile, the patients had this, this ablative process, which could you know, be dangerous to them. 
and then insert them back in the body. Does mm -hmm. that sound like an ideal solution? It is a solution. Right. And it's way better than suffering from sickle cell for the rest of your life. Okay. But think about the ideal solution. What if you could just have an IV transfusion and you're right. done? Yep. That to me sounds like an ideal solution. So, but the technology steps that are required to do that is what the IGI is working on. Um, you know, you have to be able to target specific cells in an ocean of different cells. You have to find the specific tissue and the specific cell. And then when that when that package finds the, the, the cell, you then need to be able to get into the cell at high efficiency and do your edits at a high enough efficiency for it to be able to work. It's a tremendously hard challenge. It requires chemists. It requires molecular biologists. Honestly, it requires microbiologists to be able to discover some of the CRISPR systems that might be able to carry big enough payloads for you to be able to do some of the corrective edits and things to be able to do that. It requires a lot of funding and it requires those larger teams, but that's what the IGI does. And we're looking at lipid nanoparticles. We're looking at um, what used to be called virus-like particles, but now they're, uh, Jennifer uh, Dowden and her team are looking at enveloped delivery vehicles. So EDVs. Um, we're looking at uh, ribonuclear protein assemblies, RMPs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not we're not backing just one of those technologies. Our delivery collective is looking at all of those technologies. LMPs might be the best solution for one thing, but RMPs may be a, a, a solution for the uh, you know the best solution for another approach. We're not just looking at rare genetic disease and and single mutation uh, blood disorders. Yep. We're going after cancer now with with Alex Marson at, at the Gladstone Institute um, with his CRISPR for cancer project and program that he's just started. But our role in that is in deliver in, in vivo systemic delivery to target and correct T cells or not correct, but modify T cells to be able to, to be able to do that instead of having to do it ex vivo, which is mainly what Alex and his, his groups over uh, across the Bay are trying to do. So, so it, it's, 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 it really it defines what the IGI is about for health. Mm -hmm. That single dose systemic ideal solution will absolutely lower costs. No doubt it will lower costs instead of having all of those steps all of those steps and that, that results in the $2 million price tag, if you just do one step, we think it's 10X, 100X lower in price, okay? And so that's really the driving factor for us. It's the increase in affordability, the increase in accessibility. We actually just published um, a, a report that we're calling our affordability task force, where we brought together scientists, manufacturers, insurance companies, regulators, uh, bioethicists, and they all banded together to start to, to brainstorm paths to accessible and affordable cures. And that's, again, that's the role that the IGI plays. So we combine the technologists with those other um, uh, people, sit them at the same table to, to start to devise and start to map out real concrete paths to make an accessible and affordable solutions in health. And we hope to do exactly the same thing for agriculture and climate as well. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's a little bit of information. Our delivery collective, but really, we're pushing to cancer. We're pushing. Um, Ross Wilson and Jennifer Doudna just got a big twenty-five million dollar NIH award that's going to focus on um, ALS and Huntington's um, and and using approaches, uh, uh, you know, to, to be able to target those diseases as well. So, we're really our delivery collective really is hitting on all cylinders right now, and we're really really excited about the future. Excellent. And, you know, and as you just mentioned, you know, climate and sustainable agriculture, and you actually use a term, uh, uh, climate change tolerance. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, you know, you, you have, uh, again, a, a wide range of projects here, everything from crispering, you know, to enhance carbon sequestration. Um, I just, a, a couple months ago, I had um, Ismahani al Wafi, who is the, the chief scientist at the United Nations uh, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and she talked, you know, because she spent time in in the desert and in some inhospitable places. Uh, and, you know, she was, she's very hot on both salinity and drought. Um, and then I had a friend that actually worked in the, uh, the citrus business down in Florida. And I was always citrus amazed. Greening. Oh my God. It's terrible. I was always amazed by the number behind, you know, one hour of frost is, I mean, it's sickening how, the numbers behind, but anyhow, um, talk a little bit, because, you know, clearly, you know, we, we think about, uh, you know, what we what we hear more about is things like herbicide and pesticide resistance mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but these climate change issues, whether it's salinity and drought or yep. you know, the, the other end of that thing, billions and billions of, of, of dollars of problems for 
people, especially in the global south, uh, with the, uh, yep. Yep. Uh, the drought. Right. Um, talk a little bit about what you're doing here, if you would. Yeah, well, so so let me start by just sort of talking about our overall and overarching climate strategy at the IGI. So there's really three parts to that strategy. The first part is exactly what you just described. Um, we want to ensure food security for a growing population in the world. And with a special focus towards the global south, um, to our low middle income countries and low middle income farmers. That's Those are the individuals that are on the front line of, of climate change, whether that's heat tolerance, whether it's salinity, whether it's drought. Um, these are daily occurrences and daily problems around the world. And so our number one pillar is to use CRISPR, to use genome editing, to be able to provide more food security by editing crops uh, in a way, oftentimes, by the way, that would not be considered GMOs by a majority of the world, okay? And we wanna use this technology to be able to add beneficial traits that will provide climate resiliency, okay? That is that is goal number one. But it goes along with goal number two and goal number three, and goal number two is to reduce agricultural emissions. If we continue farming the way we're farming right now, uh, I believe that agriculture is actually going to um, supersede the, the energy sector is sort of like the number one contributor to climate change yeah. because that energy sector is going to be going down with EVs, with bioenergy, with solar, wind. Um, that energy sector is on a course and tra a trajectory over the course of the next 50 years to start to go down. The agricultural emissions from things like livestock and rice and um, you know uh, methane, nitrous oxide, those do not have viable solutions right now on how we're going to reduce nitrogen fertilizer use. How are we going to how are we going to uh, reduce methane emissions from things like cows and rice? They're not good viable solutions in those areas right now. And if we have to feed two billion more people by 2050, mm -hmm. how are we going to do that? It's just mm -hmm. going to get worse. The emissions are just they're not on a downward trajectory. So goal number two for us is to, to work. And I mentioned the cow uh, uh, gut uh, methane emission work that we're gonna be doing. That's one facet of that. But we're also working really intensely on rice and looking at the rice soil microbiome where nitrous oxide and methane emissions are, are contrib contributing to, to climate change. And so the, you know, emission reduction is step number two. But then I think there's a real opportunity on the table for carbon removal as well. And agricultural soils have actually lost 480 uh, or more gigatons of carbon um, over, since we started modern, modern agricultural approaches. So 480 gigatons of carbon has been lost from those mm -hmm. ag soils. So why not use better farming practices and CRISPR modified crops to actually start putting some of that carbon back? It just makes sense. And I think there's a real opportunity space to do that as well. So, so that's our three-pronged approach, but let's talk a little bit about that first, um, first step or that first kind of goal. And honestly, it's the most near-term solution, Ira. It's the most near-term mm -hmm. solution. We actually are doing an international field trial right now on a drought tolerant rice. This is work that Brian Statskowitz, our director of sustainable agriculture has done. He's demonstrated it in his laboratory. He demonstrated it in, in the greenhouses here at UC Berkeley. And now we've already sent seed. We've got all the permits. Everything's already done. We just talked to our partners a couple of weeks ago and they're gonna plant those seeds to do an international field trial to show upwards to 10 to 20% reduction in water usage by this engineered, by this, by this CRISPR modified crop. And the interesting thing is the way that it's done is that we do reduce the number of stomata on the leaves of the rice plant. The stomata mm -hmm. are the pores yep. um, where, where gas exchange occurs, and that's where the plant loses water. Yep. It's also where it, it has gas exchange for things like CO2. So unfortunately, the first attempt that we made actually reduced the photosynthetic efficiency and the yields of the crops. So we had to pivot, and we actually had to edit a different gene um, that to, to change the strategy a little bit, but that second edit actually improved it. And what we see now is a reduction in water use and uh, a maintain of yields. But we need to be able to demonstrate that in an international field trial as well. So, so drought tolerance, I think, is, is definitely one of those things that's definitely on the path to be able to make a real world impact soon. Um, pathogen and, and disease tolerance, I think, is, is another real possibility. A lot of people, including ourselves and, and Brian Staskowitz, this is really his area of expertise, He's showing that you can make edits that 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 promote disease suscept uh, that reduce disease disease susceptibility. So I think that you're talking about fungal pathogens, bacterial yep. pathogens. Um, I think there's going to be real opportunity in rice and in wheat and in things like banana and cacao. 
um, I think there's going to be real opportunities uh, to affect positive um, resilience and resistance against some of those emerging diseases. Um, now, you, you, the next steps, things like tolerance to wind and storms, um, salinity, uh, I think these are going to take a little bit longer, but I do think that with different rooting archi architectures, with different rooting depths, um, and, 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 and working with a sort of uh, exchange for that root interface, uh, I think there are ways that you can work on salinity and you can work on... Um, on, on wind and 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 tolerance to to sort of the the, the structural tolerance of, of crops and plants as well. So I think the the future is really really bright. Um, unfortunately, the private sector investment in these types of technologies has been hampered, and it's just not as great and as strong as it is in the biomedical area. I've I've talked to a lot of different VCs and and investors out there, and many of them have quoted that it's about a hundred to one. Uh, the investments in biomedical and health related applications versus in agriculture and mm. and uh, and crop crop related things. And there are a couple really, really big players in the ag space. Cool. I think that dampens the enthusiasm a little bit to yeah. try to have startups and to be able to get investments for some really innovative sort of next generation ideas. But I still am pretty confident. I'm usually an optimist in this space. And I think that over the next 10 years, we're going to start to see a really big, uh, enhancement in the number of startups and the and the number of approved crops. Um, I think we're going to see a really, really big uptick. And the first things that come out are going to be in these sort of climate tolerant, climate resilient uh, crops. Thanks. Uh, Brett, while we're um, you know, on the topic of the uh, uh, sort of the the the, the, the undiscovered the undiscovered and, and I, I put sort of put the microbiome in there because you know mm -hmm. oh, uh, we're just now yeah. realizing you know the the, the trillions of the things that live on or amongst us um some some bad but a lot good I mean, mm -hmm. we get into mm -hmm. the sort of the topic of the, the beneficial virome we're just mm -hmm. sort of scratching the surface I know you're uh you know there's things uh, that you're involved in there not just in terms of the the crispering out the, the methane from the cows but um phage uh, and sort of the mm -hmm. whole area of you know, this is a nasty era of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance and the sort of phage has always sort of sat there on the side as something that's pretty good, but we just haven't moved forward as much. Uh, another important theme that we we touch on on the show has been this one health uh, topic mm -hmm. that, hey, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, whether it's the baboon that bites the cow that infects yeah. the human and all emerging, that emerging disease antimicrobial resistance these are yeah. all dear to my my DARPA my DARPA life for sure exactly there's there's little stories here and there about you know if we if we could vaccinate these horses over here or, or these whatever hippopotamuses we can put little barriers up to to problems like the thing we just experienced the last couple of years any other interesting things along the side of this advanced genome uh, engineering that you're doing that you can mention, uh, anything, obviously nothing confidential, but other yeah. cool themes beyond the methane cow. And Well, I'll uh, make I'll make two comments. One, just back from my, my life at DARPA, one of the first programs that we started at DARPA, what DARPA was called preempt. And the concept of preempt was to do exactly what you just, what you just outlined. Um, the reason it was called preempt was because that we wanted to preempt yeah. crossover. And 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 species species hop uh, of of viral mainly RNA uh, viral um, um, pathogens, right. and so the idea was literally to vaccinate uh, 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 groups, uh, you know, uh, colonies of bats, or or uh, to go in and be able to do those things. And so I I left before the end of that program, but um, that was the concept was to try to understand species hop, the probabilistic nature of that, and then to intervene and try to decrease. The probability of species hop it through through different methods, and you can do that from from various uh, various different uh, modalities. But I just wanted to mention that there there is that project and program called Preempt, who, whose goal was to try to do that. Um, but in terms of uh, what CRISPR could potentially do on this, and I, this is one of these pet topics that I really I'm disappointed in um, the general, you know, sort of infectious disease community that mm. that. Broad spectrum vaccines, broad spectrum, uh, you know, countermeasures in the, yeah, in the yeah. DOD, we would call these medical countermeasures, right. that weren't more robustly funded, that mm -hmm. weren't prioritized more. What seemed to always be prioritized was 
predicting. Okay, let's predict what the next the next yeah. really bad thing's going to be. I I gave a big uh, a big interview to the to the West Point magazine uh, a year or so ago. The last question they asked me was, "Well, Brad, we've talked a lot about biosecurity and bio threats today. Why don't you predict what the what the next you know the next bad you know what the next <laughs> COVID is going to be?" And I refused to. I was like, "No, I'm not going to predict because I will be wrong." Um, and then we went on to talk about climate change because I think climate change, you know, is going to make is going to make right. a huge impact in the world. We don't know what the next the next COVID is going to be. So the focus has always been on let's predict what the next thing is. Let's make a vaccine for this strain or that strain, and it's all very reactionary. Why hasn't there been a bigger push for broad spectrum preemptive approaches? Yeah. And I, th I think people are thinking about it now and. They're multifaceted nanoparticles where they're trying to put a hundred or five hundred different uh, strains on the yeah. on the particle to try to yeah. You know, there's all these different approaches to try to make sort of a universal vaccine for flu or for coronavirus or whatever it is. But yeah. why hasn't there been more money and more effort pushed towards something like that? And you know the the, the other big one I think is antimicrobial resistance and yeah. this this really is taking a lot of there are a lot of headlines. I think there is momentum being being pushed here. Um, I know that the new organization ARPA-H is probably going to think about this a lot, but yeah. there, there is a sort of a global awareness now. And One Health is absolutely in that because the, the animal, the usage of antibiotics in animals, I think is a big deal. Ultimately, maybe microbiome editing could be a better antibiotic where we just target, maybe it's through phage, maybe it's through other things, um, but you could just target the one organism rather, that, rather than it affecting an entire population of microbes. So I think there's emerging technology here, but boy, I wish increase it 10x, 100x. Like, let's try to get out in front of these emerging problems rather than react, 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 because we see what happens when we react. Even through the wild successes of mRNA vaccines, which, by the way, were funded at DARPA back in 2012, right. way, way, way before uh, anybody was thinking that mRNA vaccines were, were going to be big. But why, you know, great success but we're still chasing the tail a little bit. And so why not try to preempt this with some of these other approaches? Yeah, yeah the the uh, the AMR issue is, is an issue. And every time I talk to somebody on the on the show about it, I'm always amazed that we haven't uh, put more, <laughs> put yeah. more reasons for that. The other one that always pisses me off is the fact that, you know, our tuberculosis vaccine was, you know, yeah, the, yeah. what we're using is, was developed before penicillin. But anyway, that's, that's a topic oh. for another. <laughs> and the last thing I the last thing I wanted to say is, this conversation of epigenetics, right? Yeah. Everything we've talked about with CRISPR up until this point has been, right. let's affect a plant cell, let's affect a bacterial cell and the microbiome work, let's affect a human cell, the sickle cell or, or T cell work. Right. What if we were able to affect the human cells in vivo uh, yeah. to tune the response of, of the host, of, of the human? And I think epigenetics um, yeah. is, is a possibility there because that controls gene regulation. So we are working with Lawrence Livermore National Lab on a way to be able to tune the the human response to try to provide some of that broad broad spectrum resistance against emerging threats and emerging diseases. So so there is some work there and and, and that I think might be possible. Uh, one of our you know, there's several companies now that are looking at the at the epigenome epigenetic editors to try to help tune and control uh, the, the 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 epigenome. Yep. And, and gene and gene regulation. So you know there there's other ways that are, people are thinking about you know universal vaccines and things. But maybe it's looking inward. Maybe it's looking at the host and 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 gene regulation and controlling gene regulation. Maybe one strategy to be able to provide more broad spectrum resistance. Yeah, I, I just as a side. I went a couple of years ago. I profiled um, uh, Eric Van Giesen when he was at DARPA, oh, yeah. working on the ECHO program. Eric. I hired Eric. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> small which, world. Which I have to admit, Eric would be mad if I did not mention the fact that he hired me as well. So he was go. a director at DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, right, 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 right. Um, and he hired me at DITRA. I returned the favor and hired him at DARPA. So yeah, it's uh, I, I really like Eric. Eric is brilliant. And he's made a really big impact in his uh, career at DARPA. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, Brett, what what else is hot? I mean, I obviously, you got so much going on. It's it, it, it's just so impressive. And uh, um, any other sort of public facing stuff coming up? I mean, I, I know you get to some conferences here and there, but you're going to be uh, anything, uh, any talks you're going to be giving, places that we can run into, possibly yeah, meet yeah, you, well, listen to you. What I, else is hot uh, on the calendar? 
I had the privilege of doing a TEDx Berkeley talk. Yep. Yep. I recorded it a couple months ago. Um, that has been embargoed until July. Right. So that's actually going to land probably closer to the end of July. Um, but I outlined the IGI uh, uh, climate strategy uh, right. in that in that about it was about a 15 minute uh, TEDx Berkeley talk. So that would be a big one. I'm really, right. really passionate about that topic. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I like I said before, I truly believe we cannot continue farming the way that we're farming now. It is not going to be sustainable. We're not going to be able to feed the many people we have, and we're not going to be able to continue doing it with respect to the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that are associated with farming. So, so listen to that TEDx Berkeley talk if you want to learn more about our strategy to be able to really create essentially a net zero farm. And I truly mm -hmm. believe that within the next 10, 10 years, there's going to be technologies present through our work and others that are going to be able to, to create a net zero farm. Wouldn't that be amazing if yeah. we if we're able to to take the 30% of emissions, global emissions that are responsible for agriculture, deforestation, all of these things that are trying to be used to feed, to feed our populations now. What if we we're able to get that down to zero? Mm -hmm. That would be tremendously impactful. So, so yeah, I, I encourage people to, to, to check that out. It's probably going to be released sometime in that last week of July. Outstanding. Um, I'm a big fan. I'm rooting you on. Uh, we'll Thank continue you. You. to to follow everything you're up to, Brad, it's just so impressive. You and and what you know, obviously Dr. Doudna and the rest of the team have put together. Um, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Dr. Brad Ringeisen, Executive Director, Innovative Genomics Institute, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Brad, again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk for a little while about all these amazing topics obviously thank you for doing what you do and as we like to say here on our show thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for everybody be what you do really amazing story and, and really best wishes with it all thanks ira really appreciate the opportunity and uh thank you so much